Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Huddle Up with Gus. I'm your host, former NFL quarterback Gus Farratt, and welcome to the new 1631 Digital News Studio. You know, some people say, no news is good news. Well, I say to those people, you've never read 1631digitalnews.com. Go to 1631digitalnews.com to get your latest news, sports, music, and entertainment. And maybe even listen to your favorite podcast, Huddle Up with Gus. Check it out today at www.1631digitalnews.com. Welcome to what surely will be a doozy of a matchup right here, sports fans. Whether your game is on the gridiron, at the diamond, or on the links, we can only say... Welcome to this week's Huddle Up with Gus. 15-year NFL quarterback Gus Barat's passion for sports has taken him on the field and behind the benches, playing for seven NFL franchises with 114 TDs under his belt. Gus knows who the players are and how the games are won. Oh, it's not every day you get to hang out with an NFL quarterback, huh? Okay, sports fans, from the decked out and plush 1631 Digital Studios, it's kickoff time. So snap your chin straps on and get ready to huddle up with Gus. Strange variety, but again, a big play to a left Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Huddle Up with Gus. I'm your host, 15-year NFL quarterback Gus Farratt, and I want to welcome you to the 1631 Digital News Studio. Doesn't look like it today. I had to change my backdrop a little bit, but uh, I'm in a room where I get good Wi-Fi signal, just like our guest is getting good Wi-Fi signal today. But uh, I want to thank 1631 Digital News for all the help they give me. I want to thank my team, uh, Ian Kiss, Terry Schulman, uh, Super Duke, producer Brian. And I also want to thank Sounder FM for hosting us on their platform. Sounder FM does a great job of uh, using new technologies to really help you promote and monetize your podcast. So today, uh, our guest has a new book coming out. Uh, He grew up in Northern Virginia. He went to Oakton High School. He is uh, the president of Joe Gibbs Racing, and his book is called Taking the Lead. So we're going to get into that a little bit later, but we're going to go back to his origin story. So joining us today is Dave Alpern. Uh, Dave, how are you doing, buddy? Hey, Gus, I, I appreciate the intro. I really appreciate you having me on. I'm doing well. So, you know, it was funny. We were talking before the show here that our careers kind of started <laughs> around the same time, you know, and, and you're, you've are you never transitioned, which, well, only in, in the business, uh, which has grown tremendously since you started. But for me, I've transitioned a bunch of times. But uh, tell me about <laughs> growing up in yeah. Virginia and, uh, you know, how your love of sports came to be. Yeah, well, honestly, yeah, I grew up, so I went to Oakton, and I was so I was a late bloomer. So in every stage of life, I was kind of always the smallest. I was undersized, and um, I think that ended up having its advantage mentally later in life. But from a sports standpoint, actually pretty quick, had good hands, and I think I felt like I was fairly athletic, but really was hard to get you know, to excel when, you know, I, it was kind of a, a boy playing with men by the time I got to fifth or sixth grade as, as kids were way ahead of me. So um, my first love was football and I loved playing it in the neighborhood. I loved watching it. And of course, growing up here in DC, huge skins fan, uh, you know, they played in Super Bowl 17 when I was in seventh grade. So, so my middle school kind of all the way through, it was, it was Redskins. So I loved the NFL was again, a big um, a big Skins fan, you know, Caps and some of the other teams as well. But really, for me, it was it was NFL. And what was kind of cool was in seventh grade, um, you know, I met a kid named J.D. Gibbs who had just moved into town because his dad was the new coach of the of the Redskins. And so right. we, I, I joke that, you know, his dad started 0-5, and, and, and it's a true story. J.D. spent the night at my house the, the week that they went 0-5, and, and I literally was like, well, you know, it's been fun knowing you, but you, you know, you're, getting re- <laughs> you're getting ready to get run out of town. Um, and, you know, hey, t- tell Lombardi, nice job, you know, when you get home. But um, And so, yeah, from an early age, that just obviously deepened my passion and love for the, for the Redskins, so it'll always be home. But for me, personally, um, I played a little lacrosse, um, uh, rec league lacrosse in high school, um, but, um, my, honestly, my biggest regret in life is that I didn't go for football because I was so small. I just thought, uh, you know, <laughs> they're well, going to me out of there and they well, were pretty Oakes, good. Yeah. Yeah. They're not a small school either. Right. right there are a lot a of kids school. going to school there. Yeah. So that, that yeah. makes it difficult, but 
I always tell, you know, and I think that when you say it's a regret, I think it's just something that, that yeah. it is scary because it is a very physical sport. You know, it's not basketball or right. baseball or anything yeah, like right. that. And when, when people are twice your size, yeah. it is very yeah. scary Maybe to realize that, yeah. Yeah, that, that this guy is going to lay me out. And so, uh, you know, well, let, me show, I, let me make sure I say this though, when I got to college, man, so we played intramurals and I dominated. So that's where the, the, the fast little quick guys do really well in flag football. So I kind of came into my own playing a little flag football. And interestingly, when we went in, and we'll, I know we'll talk about the Joe Gibbs racing days, but there was a NASCAR flag football league and JD, who, who was actually a good quarterback, and I played and we won several championships. So I got to, I got to kind of get my, <laughs> a little bit of my angst out from not playing in high school in, in college and afterwards playing flag football. Well, my son played high school football and he didn't want to play anymore, but he played intramural football, like same thing yeah, at Delaware. Yeah. He went to Delaware. He's in sport management. Okay. And so Gabe was like Mr. Football for intramurals. Same thing, right? He loved yeah. it. He was a quarterback receiver. He, he'd call me up. He'd go, Dad, I caught six touchdowns today. And I'm like, okay, That's buddy. All, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So right. uh, he loved it. That that was his thing. So uh, he, he really enjoyed it. But it, it gives you so, something to do like that. What else, you, you know, if, if you're not playing yeah. a sport in college, you know, I always told him, I said, go, you know, go. You could try out for the golf team. You could do whatever. And uh, so and he 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 did intramurals. Yeah, that's good. Well, and, and I will say so in terms of other sports, I, I loved, you know, um, I, I got into some of the alternate sort of uh, extreme type of sports. So I loved surfing, skiing, snowboarding, all of those things and did those all through, you know, high school, college. And to this day, those are kind of passions of mine. Um, but anyway, yeah, no, the, the football one, I always go back to as the one that, you know, kind of would have been, would have been a lot of fun, but had some fun. Well, your body place. probably thanks you for that. Although if you <laughs> yeah. fall in skiing, surfing and all those things, so that could be pretty traumatic. I have as broken well. a lot of bones in that, but probably not as many as I would have had. I played football. Yeah. Well, those, yeah. I, I can't do either <laughs> one of those things. So you got a leg up on me there. <laughs> uh, cause yeah, I, 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 I am like a stick going down a mountain trying to ski. <laughs> I will say I'm pretty decent at skiing. And again, I live in the wrong part of the country to surf, but um, my wife and I actually met with me working at a surf shop. That's a whole nother story, but yeah. So those are some fun memories. I guess I'll count that as a sport when you're asking about my sports background. So tell me where you, we talked a little bit about your high school career yeah. um, and you went to Oakton and then where did you go after Oakton? So I actually ended up right here at George Mason university and it was, um, and I talk about this in my book, it was not my first choice. It was actually not my second choice at the time. And I wanted to go off to college. And what, what, what I ended up staying in, you know, staying at Mason while all my friends went off to different schools. And it ended up being an amazing experience. Um, first and foremost, I met my wife there who was a year behind me. And the next year after the, I do call my first year of college the worst year of my life. I, I, I went into electrical engineering, which had I taken a 10 minute personality profile, it would have told right. me run, run, don't walk. Run. Uh, small detail was I didn't really like math or science. So if you're getting into that, not a good idea. Yeah. So um, honestly, I, my dad was an electrical engineer and I did good on SAT math. And I thought, all right, I'll go do that, which was a dumb choice. So first year was a wash. Met my wife, played intramurals, helped start a fraternity, had a great exper experience here at Mason. While JD, who had become real good friends you know, through high school, he went off to William and Mary and played football and my other friends went to different places, but we would all get together in the summers and kind of grew in our friendship over through college, even though we didn't go to school together. I did not know that JD went to William and Mary. That's where my son Gunner went and played football. Oh, is that right? Yeah, he was interested. So the funny thing was JD was a quarterback. He, he went as a quarterback and then there was a guy, I, I believe his name was Chris Hakel, who ended up starting and, and, and yeah. did some time in the NFL. So JD moved to DB. And so he played DB at, uh, at, at William and Mary number 11. Yep. Oh, that is awesome. So he, um, yeah, that is great. That's a great story. I didn't know that because there are several people I know that go from Oakton down to William and Mary. Yeah. Um, and, and his love, our love for the skins obviously kept growing, you know, in, in college, we had Super Bowl 22, and then right the year we finished college, we had Super Bowl 26. So we were spoiled because I grew up thinking it's normal for your team every three years. They go to the Super Bowl. Yeah. That's how it works. And yeah. 20, no. 25 years later, I'm still waiting. Yeah, I hear <laughs> yeah. you there. So yeah. many people I talk to that are Skins fans that, that feel the same way. 
uh, and you know, I'm hoping this year my man uh, Fitz Magic gets in there and uh, yeah, does does a, does a you know turnaround for us. I would love nothing more. But we have some great memories of going, you know, going to you know, Super Bowl 26. One of the greatest memories of my life and being out there with them. And and uh, again, little did we know it would be decades before we'd go again. How many times did you make a trip to Redskin Park? I think there was an old one that was. Yeah, we, we didn't the... go out to the park as often, but we went to a lot of the games. I would say the year, um, the year they went to Super Bowl twenty six, I went to all but one home game, including playoffs, and then we all went to the. It, it's funny, myself and another guy. So JD and I had another best buddy named Moose, and we're a crazy Skins fan. We went to more games than JD did because he was at college, and his, right. Mrs. Gibbs would invite us. Even <laughs> wasn't there. And we were like, "Sorry, Jay, we're going to the game." So I think yeah. we went to more than he did that that year, but. Those are great memories. Honestly, some of the fondest memories of my life are 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 that. And I still, it's funny. I moved to Charlotte, and and look, I I I want the Panthers to do well, and I'm happy for them. But you can't make yourself like another team. And as much as I've tried, because it is sometimes painful, um, I am still just yeah, I'm burgundy and gold. I can't I can't get it out of my system. Well, yeah, so, you know, yeah. I played for seven teams, and I I understand what you're saying. Like, I've always had an affinity for the Redskins because they drafted me, you know, mm -hmm. everything that happened. I, my wife and I, we were married when I was with the Redskins. We had our three kids in at, um, uh, oh, really? what's, what's the hospital over there by you? Uh, there's fair, the there's Fairfax. Fairfax. Hospital. Yeah, yeah. Fairfax. My wife was actually working there. And, oh, really? and um, yeah, then once we had kids and we were doing okay, she, she, she retired from nursing early. Uh, but, you know, I, the one thing I do miss most, and it's still my favorite place I've ever played, is RFK. It's it's special. And actually, I just saw, I guess they're tearing it down, and they had a lot of the old legends go walk through for one last time, and many of them were tearing up. And, oh, yeah, I mean, you remember the stadium, it bounced, and oh. there, was not, there was nothing like it. And, you know, it, no, it really was a special place. I couldn't imagine the years, like I – we we had some good teams and we had a little bit of success, but nothing like yeah. going to the Super Bowls. But I can't imagine going and being on the field when you're winning in that division every year, and then you're going to the Super Bowl and you have playoff games there. What it was, what it was like. Um, do you remember some like wild games that you attended? Oh, I I was at the seat cushion game where they were. Oh, you were? Where I was there. I was. I, I, that was the year. I think I went to every game and. Um, Honestly, watching the skins, it was like watching a video game. Because if you remember, I think statistically they led the league both defensively and offensively. So, I mean, if a team was within 20 points, you're like, man, this is a nail biter. You know, I mean, they were yeah. just destroying people. They they beat the Lions 45 nothing on opening day and then ended up playing them in the championship and, you know, throttled them again. It was, it was special. So I remember that. Yeah, I remember they were um, – I remember it was, you know, 8-0, 9-0, and, and then um, you had Kornheiser writing the bandwagon thing that went. And I still saved those newspapers from when he wrote <laughs> yeah. about the bandwagon. So those were probably my most special years. And just remembering the, um, you know, coach had a tradition. And so for those of us who were, again, fortunate to kind of get to go with them, when they would win, they would go out to dinner afterwards. And we'd all be invited to go to dinner. But if it was a loss, yeah, no, we all scattered and no one after the game would go home. <laughs> So yeah, you we know, weren't we celebrating obviously, that. Obviously, we went to dinner more often than we didn't because they won a lot. But that year, it was you know every week. You're not only did you win, but you just crushed the you know. So he was always in a great mood, and, you know. And so that was kind of the one time you got to see coach because, as you know, during the season, you know, other than maybe right after the game, he was in his office working, and so you just didn't you didn't see him a lot. But there were a lot of great memories again. Spending the night at JD's house, and coach would get home from Redskins Park, and you know it's a you know whatever time, and he's you know, he'll check in with how we're doing and we'll just say, all right, how we looking? How we looking? You know, whatever. And those are, those are, those are the great memories that I'll, honestly, yeah. I'll, ch I'll cherish my whole life. Well, it's amazing that you've been with the organization. Yeah. You know, you say you've been with, with since 93, but you've really known the leaders of that organization for a long, long time. I have. And that's actually how I got my start. Cause when coach wanted to start a NASCAR team, JD was still, he, had, he was on the five-year plan. So he had an extra year and really they just needed a gopher because Joe was still coaching for the first year. And so he had this race team he was starting in Charlotte and really needed a go between to drive, you know, sign stuff, contract memorabilia, what have you. And since they trusted me, they kind of asked me and I, I talk about that in the book, how I was so honored and they had no idea early on 
that they were doing this for me. But, you know, I struggled with self-confidence and JD had a lot of friends, but he picked me. And so just picking me to be the gopher kind of for me kind of was like, wow, they really, they must really trust me. Well, look, you know, as an athlete, you don't want to let your coach down. Well, coach is my coach and I didn't want to let coach down. So early on, I kind of said, all right, <laughs> I, yeah. I'd like to, I'd like to stay here doing whatever it is. So it started as just being a gopher and, and uh, I was unpaid and that was kind of, I figured I'd do that for six months and it would look good on my resume. And actually I wanted to be a sports, a sports anchor. I wanted to be a, my dream was to be a sports center anchor. And I thought I'll do this for, a, a, you know, six months, a year, and maybe I'll meet some you, folks and I'll get a chance to do that. You wanted to be George Michael. I did. I did. Yeah. And, and I sat on the set of that show many times and seeing him going, that guy is the man. He was the man, by the way. Oh, he was, he was awesome. <laughs> sports I loved machine. what I would yeah. yeah, he did a great job with that, you know, and, yeah. and um, there were there were so many good. I mean, D.C. has so many good sports programs and radio shows Absolutely. and TV shows. They've just done it year after year. They, they do an outstanding job. Well, with you, that. Just you, because- you recently had Michael Wilburn on and I listened to that and again, big fan. And again, when I honestly one of the coolest things about coming here, I rarely watch network TV news at home. But when I get here, I'll flip on, you know, what, you know, Channel 4, just the. the and some of the some of the familiar faces, I just yeah, I do like it. It just reminds me of my childhood. Oh, uh, it takes you right back, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Like when I come to Absolutely. Pittsburgh and there's still KDKA on here, right? It's just <laughs> like, man, it just takes yeah. you back to when you were a kid and your dad was listening to it on the radio. Absolutely, so, no, absolutely. So after George Mason, right? Uh, obviously, yeah. you've been you've known the Gibbs forever, but that wasn't your right out of college, right? That wasn't, was that your first gig? It was. Or- so it was my first. So, so truthfully, I finished college and, you know, I really didn't have a great plan. I had changed majors a couple times. Um, the only thing I knew for sure is who I wanted to marry. So I met my wife and we'd been dating, but her dad, who I'm actually in his house right now, and he is one of my heroes, but he was pretty firm with, you know, until you have a firm job, you're not, you know, don't be thinking about asking my daughter. And so I had some motivation where, you know, I got to get my stuff together because, right. you know, right. she's going to, she's going to, you know, I'm going to get, I'm going to get kicked to the curb here. So I, I, um, honestly, I was living at my parents' house trying to figure out what was going on. I was debating, actually, there's a ministry called Young Life that was real important to me and special. And I actually debated, you know, hey, maybe I'll go on staff with them. I wasn't sure what I was going to do. And honestly, Coach asked me, hey, will you help out? In the first couple of months, <clears throat> it was it was from my house. Like, I, I you know, you don't need to come yeah. to Charlotte. You just need to be a go-between. That led, and actually, I, I share, I can tell you this story. What led to the full-time thing was I came up with an idea. And look, as you know, we're, we've been talking about how, how big of a deal Coach is in D.C. And I, look, up here, nobody agrees on anything except – the football team when they're good. Right. So Joe is like the one unifying thing in Washington and in the eighties and nineties, you know, he was the guy so oh, I remember yeah. thinking as a 23 year old, okay, starting this race team, gosh, if we could put shirts that said, you know, everything says Redskins, but nothing says Joe Gibbs on it. What if we put Joe Gibbs racing shirts at RFK stadium? doesn't matter if anyone knows what it is. It says Joe Gibbs on it. So I found the name of the buyer of the merchandise. This is pre-internet. So I always tell my sons, try figuring out how to make a t-shirt when you're 23 without internet. But right. so, <laughs> so I meet with the guy. He says, I'll take them on consignment. <clears throat> of course, I didn't even know what that meant. He, he said, give me a purchase order. I didn't know what that was, but all that to say, I made a sale of 72 Joe Gibbs racing t-shirts. I delivered them myself. I set up a table at RFK and they sold out in one game. And that put me on the map. And that literally got me my full-time job with Joe Gibbs Racing. And so Coach kind of went, hey, why don't you do all the T-shirt for the driver and come down and be our merchandise guy? And I I talk to students about that. that, And sometimes you don't have the opportunity to do something like that. But sometimes just go do it. Don't wait, you know, do something, add value to yourself. And I I wanted to have my own little niche. So it was the T-shirt business that kind of put me on the map and got me to go to Charlotte full time, but they still couldn't pay me <laughs> at right. first. So I went down there. Um, but yeah, I went down again. Same year, you were, you had a much more glamorous start than I did. Let's just say that they did. <laughs> they didn't have anywhere to put me, and they literally put me in a broom closet. Like they emptied our closet. And so keep in mind, I'm in, 
I, I'm the only son. I have two sisters. I'm the only son of this high achieving dad. My dad was a CIA operative and spoke multiple languages. And my sisters and I, as you mentioned, we were all born in foreign countries. And, right. you know, my dad's this rock star. And, and then I'm like, he must be so proud of me. I'm, I'm, I'm in a garage in an emptied out broom closet working for nothing, you know? And oh my like, gosh. Yeah. It was a, it was as unglamorous a start. And I would honestly do anything. I was putting stickers on cars. I was booking hotel rooms, you know, and booking a hotel room again, pre-internet meant 1-800-Hilton. Hey, do you yeah. have any hotels in <laughs> Dallas? I mean, everything was way more difficult. Um, oh yeah. I, I couldn't imagine. I mean, my kids no don't emails. understand what yeah. it's like not to have a cell phone and a computer well, we, in we your hand. We didn't even every have second. email. Yeah, we didn't have yeah. a computer. We didn't have emails. Emails was just starting. Um, and I talk about some stories with emails we can get to in my book as well that led to some other things. But no, it was, and that was my start. And I, I didn't know if I was going to last six months or well, what. Even think about this when you had to drive from DC or Northern Virginia down to Charlotte, we didn't have Google Maps. How you know you had a roadmap probably on on my lap I had a roadmap <laughs> and actually here's a funny thing you'll appreciate so I would drive coaches coach had a they had a Chevy Blazer and I'll never forget it had a phone in it and it was the coolest thing and I, it was probably like five dollars and I was you know I was like I am not picking this thing up but right. I remember it ra it rang once and it was coach and he called me in the phone in the car. I was driving down, you know, 95 and I was like, I've made it big right now. I am, I am driving coach's <laughs> car, talking on a phone in the car. I thought that oh, was- Oh, you're just on the thing. phone looking at people yeah. beside you like, I'm, hey. I'm on the phone going, I'm, talk, I'm talking to coach right now. You know, yeah. I was like, Bennett, he's not paying me to do this. But, um, you know, I mean, again, I'm, 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 so yeah, I just remember what a big deal. Yeah, I had a literally an atlas and it, you would like lay it on the steering wheel uh -huh. and you're mapping it out, you know, where you're going. Oh, everything was- I, I listen. I delivered pizzas at Mason, and I tell my sons try delivering pizzas without GPS or a cell phone. You look at a map, you memorize the turns, and you go. If you get lost, you got to drive all the way back. <laughs> yeah, and you hope you find the road you're looking for, <laughs> yeah. right? Like, it was you get a nightmare. Lost. Yeah, in Northern Virginia but, isn't that easy. No, that is that is true. So it's funny how much more you say it's more efficient, but I, I have a feeling we're all like way less stressed out back then. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone is now. You're right. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like yeah. Er everything is, is super intense yeah. and has to be done quick. Back in the day, it was like there Back was no the half day. hour, like, hey, the food's going to get here in a half hour. Oh, I, gosh. I don't yeah. even know how, like, often delivery was happening. No, no, it wasn't. It was not really a thing. Yeah, no, it was crazy. So tell me a little bit about, if you can tell me, why Coach Gibbs wanted to start a racing team when he's been the coach yeah. of this amazing, uh, you know, football team for years. Yeah. You know, I think he talks about he always had a love for cars. He drag raced out in California and he actually kind of sat down with his boys and they talked about how can we get into business together and or, or, or coach together. And I think the boys kind of expressed, you know, you know, talking to him later in life. Look, football is what took that away from them. And so I don't think they all wanted to get in that lifestyle, to be honest with you. And their model yeah. was a guy that slept at the office three nights a week. And so I think coach realized that's probably not the thing for us, but I'd love to do something with the boys. So he honestly dreamed about this. And, and you know, it's another example of getting into something right at the right time, because getting into NASCAR today would be almost you know, very difficult the way yeah. we did it. But, hey, you needed 15 people. And he... He wrote down five companies said NASCAR's a little different. We make about 80% of our revenue from sponsorship. So you have to have a sponsor. So he said, Hey, I'm going to go meet with some sponsors. And one of them was interstate batteries, ironically in Dallas, Texas. So here, the, here, the, here, the red right. States coach goes to <laughs> Dallas and meets with Norm Miller and, and, and his brother, Tommy, the chairman and, you know, the founders of interstate and writes, shows him a piece of paper and says, I've got a dream. I don't have a driver. I don't have a shop. We don't have a car. We have nothing. But if you sign up, we'll do it. And the funny story is coach called them back the next day because he felt so – he, he left the meeting and thought, that was – this guy must think I'm crazy. So he called him back to say, hey, listen, I, I'm sorry. And and, and one goes, no, I think actually we're going to do this. And so wow. they put us on the map. And so with that sponsor, Joe started a race team. And, and back then, we thought it would be like this forever. It was 15 people. 
I say 15, there were 18, but it was 15 real people who knew what they were doing, plus JD, Gibbs, myself, and another <laughs> young guy that they hired. And we had no idea what we were doing. Um, you were just the gophers. We were the gophers. And, and, and that's how it started. And we had one driver and one sponsor. And we thought, okay, it's going to be this little 15-person family business. And then over time, what ended up happening was, you know, it, it kept growing. And then we moved to two teams and then to three and then to four. And today we have around 500 employees and, you know, we have over 350,000 square feet and we're racing in eight different, yeah. you know, series. And well, how, you have what? You have four teams, right? So we have four in the, in what's our premier series. And what, what's unique about that. And so for people listening that aren't fans, what's really, it's kind of interesting. What's different about us is we actually have teams competing against each other. So any given Sunday, there are 40 cars turning left in circles for about three hours. And of those 40 cars, four of them belong to us. So they have different schemes, different part uh, uh, sponsors on them. You know, one, one says FedEx, yeah. one says M&M's. You know, and, um, um, and at the end of the day, I, I, I compare it to, I have three boys. It's like your kids all being in a, in a right. you just don't want them to get in a fight. You know, someone's going to be hacked off at the end because they can't all win. Um, and so that's it. And so, yeah, we compete four cars and we have four in what's called the cup series, which would be our, yeah. our, our major leagues. And then there's a triple a series called Xfinity. We have another four teams that race on Saturday and that, and then we have, actually, we have a development car in the lower series that happens to be raced by coach's grandson, Ty, who is kicking wow. everyone's rear end right now and doing really well. So he's only 18 and he's really, he's, he's legit. So, so what fun. makes, so, what makes you legit? at racing like just the, so, is it just wins losses yep 100 and so that so what you look for is a pattern so when you look at the greats the trend that they have is many of them come you know unlike many stick and ball sports where there's kind of the same path you know you go high school yeah, you go yeah. college racing you could race open wheel you could race late models you could race there's different disciplines of racing so what you look yeah. for is a pattern where everything they've raced in they dominated not just won a couple races like they dominated and it, again what's the profile of that person you know they're they're a little bit different but um so what you look for is just somebody who who given and, and particularly if they drive in a situation where there are other people with the same quality equipment that they're beating because in racing unlike sports it's beyond just the athlete. It's the machine you're driving. The machine could be better than everyone else's. And so sometimes you don't know is that person in an unfairly good car and they may be not really good as a driver, or is it really the all driver? So the answer is it's both, but you look for someone who's dominated. And so I think with Ty, Joe's grandson, he is dominating the league he's in. And we moved him up to the AAA league just to race a couple to see how he would do. Um, and he won the first time he was in it. He's won twice. He's finished in the top five every time against people that have been doing it way longer. So th those are the kind of things you look at is how do you do, you, do yeah. Do you think being good, uh, I mean, you've been in the industry for so long, like being a good quarterback, there's, you know, I could tell you a lot of things that you need to do to be a good yeah. quarterback. To be a good racer, and you're talking about Ty being really good, what are some of those qualities? Is it just a feel? Like, you know, in the past, you can feel like everything that's going on. How, you know, explain to me a little bit about that. Yeah, that's interesting. So you have your, what I would call once in a generation type talents. And 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 so I would describe Tony Stewart. So probably a name you've heard of. We recruited yeah, him yeah. to come to NASCAR. He raced for us. Kyle Busch. You got guys like that. There, there, there are some different traits. Um, I think some of it's God given. Uh, again, like I said, I, I could have all the traits I'm going to describe, but I was not gifted with certain things I would need to have to be an elite quarterback. So for yeah. a driver, some of it is God given. Some of it, interestingly, is 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 an uncanny. So, so the way I would describe it, it's an uncanny feel, like a like an attention to detail that most people don't have. The example I would give, what in, in racing, one of the most important things is. When you're the driver, you're the only one that can feel what the car is doing. So yeah. being able to articulate that to an engineer or a crew chief who can adjust it appropriately is sort of the secret sauce. And these special drivers are able to get in a car and say, this is exactly what I need. Down to the Kyle Busch could tell you, I need two pounds of air pressure in the right rear tire. And that wow. and you're kind of going, you're kind of going, huh? And then yeah. beyond that, there's a there's a fearlessness, you know, the ability to go into a yeah. corner deeper than someone. There is a feel for it. There, there is a level of arrogance. Um, and I don't mean that in a negative way. It's just a, 
and uber confidence. Um, and, and honestly, and look, you've seen this. I think genius in any field, whether you're Steve Jobs in your field or whether you're Tom Brady, you're just a little different. It's like when you see that person, you go, they're different. You know, they're, there's just, your brain is thinking of things that other yeah. people aren't. And I think in our sport, it's no different. There are genius drivers who just act differently. They may be a little more difficult sometimes to deal with, but you kind of put up with it because you go, this person's a genius. You know, that's the only way I can describe it. And you just know, I mean, you know, you're in the room with someone like that. You go, oh, that person's different. Do they, you know, so like a lot of times you'll hear about athletes that, you know, when you cross that white line, you become a different person. So drivers are the same way. When they get in that car, they're they're a completely different person. The switch gets flipped. Um, it's it's and, and in our sport, you know, your your life honestly can be on the line. So there's an intensity and you can hear it in their voice. The interesting thing about NASCAR that I think is really cool. We are the only professional sport where our athletes are live mic'd during the entire event. So you can, yeah. a fan can listen to a scanner and hear them. And, you know, a lot of these guys are very different during the race, much like you probably, you know, you probably had some of the nicest, you know, kindest family men that, man, when they get on the field, you're like, oh my gosh, who are you? You know, you, you, yeah. you, you flip they, the switch. Yeah. They were usually laying on top of me and, and <laughs> laughing at me as they were sacking me. So, uh, I mean, it's yeah, a good they're... thing the NFL doesn't live mic every player. You'd probably have a tough time with corporate sponsorship. Oh, yeah. You need a battle. Yeah. People say well, stuff. Well, and I will say that some of the coaches are just as bad. <laughs> at, no, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so yeah, no, I think during it there's an intensity and in, and in, you know uh, during the race and and you get to, the one of the neat things about our sport is you get to join along and listen to it and so I scan the drivers I I can hear them and you know it's funny the great ones even when the car they'll be going on this is the worst car I've ever driven I can't and you're and you're thinking to yourself he's leading right now he's winning you know and he's telling us the car stinks so they're 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 never satisfied they want to right. be better you know so it's it is yeah. fun to listen to them. That is amazing. Hey, everyone, uh, I want to thank you for listening. Uh, we're going to take a little break right now, but uh, we'll, we'll be right back. We're talking with Dave Alpern from Joe Gibbs Racing. Hey, how to walk with Gus listeners, Manscaped. They sent me, uh, they hooked me up with a bunch of tools and formulations for their package 3.0 kit uh so you know i want to show you guys what's in the perfect package right we all think we got a perfect package but they sent me the perfect package 3.0 kit i want to show you what they sent me so it was crazy it came in this great box um you know and you can see what it says they will thank you because they send us this awesome trimmer they sent us uh you know stuff that makes you smell better and then, uh, you know, they sent me this great, uh, some boxers even, which you get, right? Protect them. And then, uh, you know, they sent me this uh, cool sack, I guess you want to call it, to store all your stuff in. So uh, it's been great. Uh, Manscaped sent me a bunch of products, um, you know, and, and, you know, you can see it all on here. Uh, you know, you can go to manscaped.com and put in the code uh, Gus Ferrat, that's G-U-S-F-R-E-R-O-T-T-E, get 20% off and free shipping when you use that code. But you can get a kit, you can get individual items, like um, this way cool groomer that has a little LED light, um, ceramic, uh, these things come apart, they're waterproof, you can do a lot with them, so uh, you know, Manscaped is great. You know, it's it's funny. I remember when I was playing with the Denver Broncos, and I'm not going to mention any names, but uh, there was a gentleman who was playing on our team. And, uh, you know, if he ever hears the story, he'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But uh, he brought his own clippers in one time, and he used it to trim his beard up, his goatee and everything. And uh, he had them there for about two or three weeks. And he goes in around the corner, he walks in and there's a person another player that is actually manscaping with his beard trimmer so you know one of the things is you don't want to use the same trimmer down there that you use up here so uh he kind of freaked out a little bit and he said hey 
how long have you been using that tool there? And he said, well, it showed up here about three weeks ago and I've been using it ever since. So, you know, there is a lesson learned that, uh, you know, don't leave things out. And probably if it would have just said Manscaped on it, we wouldn't have had that issue. But it's probably one of the funniest uh, taking care of your ball stories I've ever heard or been around in the locker room in the NFL. So uh, it's a great story. Um, but, you know, I always said there was no way to know. There was no name on it. And the guy was just using it. And another guy was using it. It was, it, it was not good. But it's a heck of a funny story. So one of the best I've ever heard in my 15 years playing in the league. Um, but, you know, there's so many great things about Manscaped and what they're doing. Uh, because guys, you got to take care of yourself. Even though I got gray hair um, and getting older, but uh, you still have to maintain some sort of uh, grooming, right? And so, um, you know, we all work out. For me, I like working in my yard, doing those things now that I'm retired, getting a little sweat on and everything. You want to smell good? Uh, you know, you got to take care of yourself. They got some great products. Um, you know, this one. A little uh, ball deodorant. We all need that here and there. Um, after you know, working the yard, taking a hike, doing a walk, whatever you do, um, it's a great thing. But uh, there's so many great products. Um, I want to thank Manscaped for sending them to me. Um, the Lawnmower 3.0. Obviously, you can use it anywhere in your body. But I'm sure you guys have all seen the commercials. But uh, this is one. Just letting you know that uh, the lawnmower 3.0 comes with the perfect kit you can buy the lawnmower by itself you can buy all these products individually they even sent me this wonderful shirt and you can see the back your balls will thank you and then here's the front so it's an awesome shirt they have great gear and you know what sometimes you can just sit back take care of your balls a little bit and and, and read the paper so I think Manscaped even has their own daily news, so which is great. So don't forget that uh, you can go to the code Gus Ferrat, and uh, that's G U S F R E R O T T E, uh, and you can save twenty percent on any products. The complete, the perfect uh, package gift set, and uh, you know you can save twenty percent and get free shipping. So use the code Gus Ferrat, G U S. F-R-E-R-O-T-T-E. Hey, everybody spells my name wrong. They even spelled it wrong in the back of my Pro Bowl jersey. So, you know, I gotta I gotta help you guys out. So don't forget how important it is that you use these products, take care of yourself down below, and have some fun. Right? There's nothing closer to you than your little buddies. So use the lawnmower. Uh, use the code Gus Ferrat, save 20% and get free shipping and uh, order some great Manscaped products. We're back on Huddle Up with Gus. I want to thank um, Sounder FM for hosting us on their podcast platform. And I want to also thank 1631 Digital News down in Washington, D.C. in their new studio. Uh, I appreciate you guys uh, having me on. So today we're talking with Dave Alpern. Dave, we're back. And, you know, we've been discussing a little bit about your career. You started out as an unpaid intern driving back and forth in coach's car with that old bag <laughs> phone. I'm sure it was you, you were telling yes. me about. But, uh, you know, now you move your way up through the, the company uh, and you see everything grow. You know, we were talking before about I played 15 years and I had a transition. You've played now for since 93 till now. And you've yeah. been on the same team. Right. It's been a, it's an amazing career and you've worked your way up. And now you're kind of like the starting quarterback. You're the guy. You're the coach. You're the GM. You're whatever you want to call it. You're at the top. So tell me a little bit about that rise for you and how that happened well it, it it was it was wild and so we didn't really have a playbook we kind of made it up as we went along you know we were due to racing we had 15 people and um what was interesting was um i i mentioned i started kind of as the t-shirt guy so for a decade really that was my wheelhouse as i i said hey i'm gonna 
become an expert in licensed product. And I, I actually went to New York and met with the NFL properties and Major League Baseball. And I wanted to learn, you know, how it worked. And right. um, I, I keep a journal. And for many years, you know, into my career, I started lamenting as, as, as we sometimes tend to do. We feel sorry for ourselves. And I thought, am I going to be the t-shirt guy forever? I, I'm, I'm not appreciated, whatever. And so I had, I, I, it was kind of at each stage of my career, I kind of would think, hey, I, I know I could do more than this. Well, there was a point where I kind of ran all the PR at JGR because, again, we didn't have anybody else. So it just kind of fell to me. And right. each stage, I would do these different things until we got big enough to actually hire someone who knew what they were doing in that area. So I was the T-shirt guy. And then we hired a licensing expert. And then I was the PR guy. And we actually hired Chris, who came from the Redskins with Joe, uh, to come work for us. And so, interestingly, it was this 20-year journey of – always feeling like I was more important inside the building because I knew how much coach relied on my advice. But outside the building, there was some ego where, hey, nobody knows all that I do in here. They just think I'm the t-shirt right. guy. And I, I would get frustrated with that. And so over 20 years, that pattern went on. And little did I know I was being prepared for a job that I had no idea was ever an option. Because here I worked for a little family business. I'm not a member of the family. And then in 2015, you know, JD, who was our president, um, got sick. And, yeah. uh, you know, about six months to a year into his illness, <clears throat> it was clear that he couldn't, <clears throat> he couldn't operate, you know, anymore as the president. He would continue to come in, but he was not able to function. And so, you know, the family came to me and coach sat down and he said, you know, Dave, we, we want you to be the president. And, and it's kind of like everything, you know, kind of made sense. Like, okay, now I understand, you know, each of those things I did now is going to equip yeah. me because now I understand all of those areas, which was why I was really the only one that was to do it. And and I actually talk about in my book, how the day that I became president, interestingly, was honestly, it was one of the worst days of my life because it, it, it was this, it was this confirmation that, oh my gosh, JD's really not getting better. Like this yeah. is really happening. And, um, you just kept thinking one day they were going to go, you know, we figured it out. JD's going to get better and you, everyone was going to, you know, so, so it was like for 20 years, I thought if only I could have more responsibility, whatever, then all of a sudden I became the president. And my first journal entry was, I wish I was still the teacher guy because I, I, now it was like, I, I used to wonder, you know, how does JD sleep at night knowing there are 500 families depending on him and his dad to make good decisions. Cause you think about that. It's yeah. not just the 500 people that work for you. It's their, it's their families. And then all these corporate partners, you know, FedEx, Mars, Toyota, they have thousands of employees that every week are looking to us to make smart decisions. And it's a lot easier to be a, you know, a chief of staff giving advice than being the one that actually has to do this stuff. And so that transition for me was tough. So that, that's kind of how my journey went. It was very, you know, I could have scripted a thousand scripts and this would not have been one of them. And, you know, my name isn't Gibbs and I'm the president of their family business, which Joe literally started so he could hand it to his sons and his other son, Coy, fortunately, is he's with us and he's, you know, he's co-chairman with Joe. And, um, you know, I, I get to work. I get the privilege of working with two Gibbses, but um Coy worked on our motocross team for many years. He played football at Stanford and then went and we started a motocross team. So he wasn't in the day-to-day -day operations of the NASCAR part for the first for the first while. So all that to say, it was, it was a, a very wild journey. And one thing I wanted to note was, you know, most leadership books are written from the perspective of what I call the alpha leader, you know, that type yeah. of alpha leader, which is what Joe is. That, that's who I, right. I, I, as you know, I work, <laughs> I work for the, Uber alpha leader walks in the room. That's the person in charge, you know, and yeah. I, I am not that I am very opposite of that. I'm and, and mine is more a theme of reluctant leadership. And I think that resonates with people. And so I, I think that's one of the things that's unique about the book is it's actually it contrasts the two of us. If I were an alpha leader, we would have killed each other a long time ago anyway. And so I yeah. think our complementary leadership styles have been what makes it work. And I kind of detail that book. So whichever one you relate to more, I kind of walk through both of them. Um, you know, and so all that to say, it's a long answer, but it was a very, um, you know, non-conventional journey that was not one that I ever could have scripted out. 
which is actually yeah. why I wrote a book about it. <laughs> yeah, well, it was very bittersweet for you. I mean, all it the hard was, work yeah. and then you lose uh, your, your best friend. Um, so that had to be very difficult, but you're also part of the family. I know your last name doesn't have Gibbs in it, but it, uh, right. from our, from our story, uh, you know, that you're telling us is that you've been a part of their family for a long, long time. And that's why they trusted you to, uh, take over this leadership right. role. And they've seen your, the success you've had. And, and I love the, 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 what you say in your book about kind of do more than what you're worth. I think that's kind of right. what you were saying in your book. So tell yeah. us, tell us a little bit about the points. Like in your first yeah. chapter of your book, you you have some points that you should live by, and I, I, I yeah. think that it was really good. And I like that. I'm I'm really I want my son to read your book just because he's starting out in sport management. He's he's interning at the Hall of Fame this summer, which is really exciting. Oh, that's for fantastic. Him. That's yeah, great. and and but I want him to under you know. The, the, you got to do all these extra things that, that you don't want to do, but you need to do. Well, I, I talk about the, the, there's kind of five sections. The first section, yes, yeah, delivering more than you cost. And the idea is if, right. if you want to have job security, I talk about making yourself indispensable and the way you make yourself, you know, be that person they absolutely can't do without. And, and, you know, when you're an unpaid intern, delivering more than you cost is a very low bar. Right, <laughs> but I would argue, you know, hey, Tom Brady makes a lot of money. Does he deliver more than he costs? Absolutely. And so, and and particularly when I talk to students or people starting out, there's easy steps that are a choice. It's not you don't have to be a, you know, like I talked earlier about these gifted people. These are choices. There. So, what's one of them? Be great at little things. Never say yeah. that's not my job. Um, you know, I talk about being a fountain, not a drain. That person that you know. Uh, makes other people around them better. I mean, who's the most valuable person on any team? It's a person who makes everyone around them better. And that's a particularly hard one, I think, for younger people. Your son and I think my sons are probably similar ages. Think about their whole life. It's been a competition. You're, you're competing for a grade point average. You're competing to get class rank, to get into college, to make a team. So it shouldn't be a surprise that when they enter the workforce, they have a me, 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 you know, I'm going to, I'm going to climb to the top. Why would you ever think one of them's going to go, Hey, how do I, how do I make this person next to me better? Or how do I, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yet, yeah. That would be a hard. Decision maker. I can tell you it's the latter. It's the, it's the other people. It, it's the other focused people that are actually the best team players. The, that person that you say, that person makes, he or she makes everyone around them better. They're an encourager. They're, you know, whatever it is. And so there, these are little steps that, that I think, you know, when you're sitting in a broom closet going, how do I, <laughs> what's my path? Often we're thinking about, I wish I had that corner office. I wish I had this title. When the reality is just be great at where you are right now. Be great. Doesn't yeah. mean you can't plan or dream. Be really good at what you do. And, and, and being great at little things often leads to being entrusted with bigger things. Right, right. And I love the part of your story where you talked about uh, um, who won the championship and then the other three drivers. Oh, yeah. You yeah. really talk about it like FedEx is there. But, you know, this, yeah. is, this is for this is the last race. This is for all the marbles. And there's the guy who won. There's the other three who haven't won. They're all PO'd. Yeah. You know, they're upset. And you go yeah. see them first, which I thought was amazing. Well, it's not your first, I, I will be the first to say that's not your first inclination. And again, we're the only sport where when we go to our championship game, you know, it's not you either won or you lost. When one team wins, you have to be sensitive that three other teams, you know, didn't right. win. And and those partners and the workers that you have that work on those are just as important to you. And yeah, no, it is, again, same analogy. If you have multiple kids, you know what I'm talking about. They oh, all go yeah. run a race. Two of them collapse crying because they didn't win. And the one who wins, where do you, what do you do? <laughs> it's yeah. like, you know, you know, you, it's not going to be a three-way tie. So yeah, I think all of those things in there, but um, are, are important and they're hard. But I think one of the things and th that I've learned is the lesson of delivering more than you cost isn't just as a person. I think it's also as a company. I mean, if you want to keep customers, Hey, deliver more value to them than they're paying you. And, and you'll always have a customer. And that's our philosophy with our folks is if yeah. FedEx is paying us for X, Y, and Z at the end of the year, we want them to say best money we ever spent yeah, by awesome. over delivering, you know? 
Well, I can't. You know, how how many square feet did you say the facility was? <laughs> our main one's about two hundred and fifty, and then we have actually one right down the road for our AAA, our Xfinity team. That's another hundred thousand. So yeah, it's it's like a NASA facility. It's massive. And how many square feet was the first garage? Less than ten thousand, and with fifty people and very few offices. Thus, the broom closet for your yeah, right, right. <laughs> for, for Dave, we're gonna. Hey, yeah. Dave, we got this great office for you. Yeah, yeah. They it also includes that. sweeping up the garage every now and then. It just has no <laughs> electrical outlets because it kind of used to be a closet. So yeah. Yeah. No, that that's <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. So you have all this incredible experience with with Joe Gibbs, his family his team he's built and you've seen it grow from the bottom up and, yeah. and now you say, I'm going to take all this experience and this leadership that I've learned from, like you say, one of the alpha leaders that yeah. was not only in racing, but also in the NFL. I mean, he's which, in two hall of fames. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Which is, which is amazing. And uh, so you, you go to write this book. Tell me about how it started for you, because it seems like it was a natural fit because you journal. It, 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 it's funny. I, I actually appreciate you saying that because it wasn't. Um, it, I, I'm also very ADD and it's hard for me to write for an extent. Journal's perfect because you can write a couple thoughts and then you're done. Yeah. Book, book, not so much. Um, the, 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 the quick story is about 10 years ago, my father, who I mentioned earlier, he was going to write a memoir about his CIA days. And yeah. none of us, I didn't know where my dad worked till I was 16. So you know, we were all excited. My dad's going to finally write a book. And he got about three chapters through it and he got cancer. And I urged him, you know, dad, let me record all your stories. And that way, if you can't finish it, I'll make sure. Yeah. And, you know, my dad was ever the optimist and he didn't let me. And my dad passed away and, you know, I'm sorry. only got three chapters of his book done. Well, I appreciate that. And, and, you know, I've, I've often thought, you know, he deprived us and future generations of that amazing story. And yeah. so it was, it was when my dad died that I told my wife, I said, look, my story, and keep in mind at the time, JD wasn't sick and I wasn't yet yeah. present, but I just said, hey, look, my story's not as exciting as my dad's, but I want our boys and their kids to know this amazing story of Joe Gibbs racing and how I started in a broom closet. So I'm going to write a book. So I, I set up an app on my phone that was called Book on a Notes app. And honestly, for the next five, six years, every time I'd get on a plane, which was a lot, I would just, you know, or or I would be in the car and I would voice memo, you know, um, treat people like a soul not a transaction or just something that I discovered or learned or thought of. Yeah. And, and about three years ago, you know, again, deep into JD's illness, it just sort of all felt like, all right, this is the time to aggregate all these notes. And I wrote a, a proposal and was able to get a publishing deal. And then it took, um, it took about two years from working with a, 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 I had a, a writer to help me who I describe as an interior designer. He took all my thoughts in the furniture and rearranged it in right. a coherent manner. Um, yeah. yeah. And we, and we did it and we turned, I mean, we turned the manuscript in all the way last June. And so then there was some editing and now there's the marketing of it. So all that to say, it was a very long process. The writing of it for me came in short spurts. I would wake up an hour early, two or three days a week. That was all I could do at a time. It was like an hour. And then my brain yeah. would be, I was like, it would turn to mush. And some mornings I would write nothing. Um, and honestly, I, I, I'll share this with you. The month before I turned it in, just over a year ago, I told my wife, I'm going to the publisher and I'm going to return everything. And I, I'm, I'm not turning this book in. I'm not doing it. It's, I just don't like it. Like I, I thought, and again, that's part of my personality is just yeah, lack yeah. of confidence. And I thought, no one's going to want to read this. I, I'm having trouble putting it all together. And, you know, the publisher urged me, no, this is really good. I think you've got something here. And so anyway, I'm glad I went through with it. And I, now I've gotten some really great feedback and I'm glad and, you know, glad that I wrote it, um, actually. So and I hope it encourages folks. It's not meant to discourage anyone. I want it to be really an encouragement. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, coming from selling 70 Redskin Joe Gibbs <laughs> T-shirts. Yeah. <laughs> Joe Gibbs racing T-shirts at RFK yeah. to writing a book. And, you know, you think yeah. about your path is is incredible. I mean, uh, it reminds me of when I interviewed Matthew McConaughey. Right, he's a huge huh. Skins fan. Yeah, he is. And he just wrote that uh, wrote a book called Green Lights. But he's the same way where he journaled everything, like store his his from when he was a kid. Right, he said, "I just got to write it all yeah. down," and he did. And he had all these journals. And his thing was he went out 
instead of doing voice memos, he went out to the desert and and kind of started writing his book. Yeah, you know, he funny. had to be a little more dramatic than, you know, getting on a plane. But uh, it reminds me that because even though you say that it, it didn't kind of go together, but I really think it did because you put all your thoughts down and you could see them and then somebody could help you organize them. I mean, I have my wife read my stuff that I write all the time because she's a thousand times better than I would ever be. Well, that's good. And interestingly, one of my sons, I've got three boys and they're really smart kids. And one of my boys, Austin, all the boys were actually very helpful with it. But Austin, I would honestly, I would send him chapters and I would send him late at night. And by the time I woke up in the morning, he would red mark stuff. And I was like, you are under, like, you need to do this for a living. And he, this is after college, he's got a full-time job and he had a gift. So I did have some help and he would say, yeah, dad, I don't like the way you said this or whatever. So I had some help from my family. Again, uh, Dave Thomas, who helped me collaborate, did a great job. And I am happy with the way that it turned out and got some affirmation from some folks. You know, I sent the manuscript to a few folks who were there from the beginning and said, look, I can't remember what I had for breakfast yesterday. So can you make sure the way that I <laughs> describe this is correct? And so I got some of that. And what was really cool for me was a few months ago, I got to record the audiobook. So that it's me reading the audiobook. And I, you know, to think, again, I have to record an audio book. Are you serious? So if, if you're really bored and you want to listen to me for, I don't know how long it takes start to finish, probably six or seven hours, but you can get the audio yeah, book too. But uh, that's, that's <laughs> how I love to read is listen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm like you, like I start reading and I, you know, my, I'm, my attention span goes start real short reading. and yeah. Yeah. It's like, uh, you know, for me, for golf, I figure that's why I'm not like really good at golf because, uh, oh, you gosh, know, you're, uh, uh, if a round takes like four and a half hours, I'm like out of it, you know. Well, we to, don't get me into golf because I, I I was humiliated about three, I'll tell you real quick, about three years ago, our friends at FedEx, you know, they invited me to play in the Pro-Am at the St. Jude's Classic. And I told the guy, I told my buddy at FedEx, I, I, I would do it. you know, I'm not a good golfer, but I'm going to kill you if you put us in a high profile group. He's like, <laughs> oh, no, no, we're good. We're good. And the night before I get to Memphis and he still hasn't told me. And I text him, and I'm like, you got to tell me who we're playing with tomorrow. He goes, all right, we're playing with John Daly and Brett Bear from Fox News, who's like a two handicap. And I literally replied, I'm going to kill you. And so, yeah. I, you know, I had to humiliate myself for the whole day. And honestly, I came home and I told my wife, I said, I know I'm not going to take lessons or practice as much as I need to, to get better. So I'm done. And I quit. I quit like three years ago. I'm, like, I'm not playing golf anymore. I'm too competitive to be that bad at something. So anyway, it is hard, though, <laughs> like when you are competitive and it's just like, oh, where do these yips right. come from? I don't know. I don't understand it. It's like and then yeah. I've played a lot of pro amps and then all of a sudden there's fans like, oh, what if I hit one of these fans? That's crazy. Yeah, you have no. Oh, my gosh. So, yeah, we never played more. It was probably 150 people at most because we teed off at like 730 in the morning. And by the way, both of those guys were delightful. I mean, the nicest guy, John Daly literally was giving me lessons by the sixth hole. He was like shifting my <laughs> hips and he couldn't have not, he could not have been nicer. Um, so I just was so Did, embarrassed. Were you, yeah. Were you holding his beer and cigarette at the same time? <laughs> that I, I will not make a comment on that, but there might've been both. <laughs> there might, there might've been both involved. I'm not sure. <laughs> but it was something. Um, it was something uh, in, in a little yeah, red it cup. Was sub, yeah, it was, it was no, could not so, have been nicer. Hey, I, um, I appreciate you coming on and telling me your yeah. story. I think it's great. And we're talking about taking the lead, your, your, your book out and uh, all these things. But, uh, you know, I wanted to ask you one last thing was last year with the pandemic, it yeah. was really hard for a lot of sports teams. And uh, how did NASCAR and Joe Gibbs Racing take on the pandemic and really keep their fans engaged in everything that was happening? So, Gus, I'm actually glad, glad you mentioned that. It, it was really remarkable. So if I'm honest, so the pandemic hits and we're about five races into a 36. We have a long season. We're five yeah. races into a 36 race season. That's and a lot of tires. As I mentioned before, you know, all of our revenue comes from sponsors who are paying you to be on TV every week. So there was a few weeks for us, as there were for many businesses, where we thought if we don't race this whole year, I don't know how we're going to make it. I mean, you're just wondering as a business, how are we going to do yeah. this? And so, well, like you it, said, you had 500 families counting on it, right? A hundred and, and right. And now they can't come into work. There's no race to prepare a car for. And so you're just kind of wondering, gosh, what are we going to do? And it was one of the more amazing things I, I have often said, and I obviously I know I'm 
you know, I'm biased because I work in NASCAR, but I think I think NASCAR is is maybe the best sport. We are at our best when there's trouble, when there's when something during a crisis. We just we have a way of rallying together, and so there were nonstop Zoom calls, literally from from the day that we it was Atlanta that we shut down with the teams. I mean, it was a grind, and it was working with local governments and tracks, and how can we do this? And if you would have asked me in March. Will you race this year? I would have said, gosh, it'll probably be August or September at best. And to NASCAR's credit, we had we missed uh, 10 weeks. We started up in May and we were able to do, um, you know, double yeah. headers and so forth, caught up and ended up being, you know, really the only sport last year, the full, you know, during the pandemic to yeah. complete a full season without an asterisk. Um, it was, it, and on top of that, what was really cool was the first week we missed, but after that, until that 10 weeks later, when we actually got on a real racetrack, we did virtual racing where, you know, Fox, who was the broadcaster, you know, Jeff Gordon and Mike Joy and the real broadcast crew and the real drivers drove a simulated race, which on TV looked very real. You know, our sport yeah. is one where, where the driver actually drives it and it, it feels the same playing a video game as it does. Yeah. And so yeah. we broadcast we were the first sport back with a fake race and got over a million viewers for event because people had nothing to watch. And I, like, all right, sure. I'll watch Kyle Busch and Denny Hamlin race on a computer game. And so yeah. we, we were able to even do that to fill TV time until we went back. So, and, and as a company, again, we had about 10 weeks where folks couldn't come into work. And then once they gave us the green light, it was actually a little bit less than that. Once we got the green light to go race, anyone who had to physically touch a car was, declared essential and they were allowed to come in so we had a limited group coming in and they were i mean our protocols were off the chart strict and we were fortunately had no issues yeah and we were able to field cars and it just looked very different you know um, and, and again joe is a coach and coaches like to be in person so he struggled yeah. with not having everybody there around oh the world, yeah you know he doesn't like the virtual stuff and he was convinced yeah. everyone's on vacation i'm like coach they're not on vacation they're, they're <laughs> they, they can't they can't come in and so you know he would he would we would do video calls with him which was kind of wild because that's not really his thing but um it, it worked honestly our sport really i'm very proud of our sport uh, for how we responded and, and but at, and at the same time i'm grateful now with all sports to see crowds and you know the Coca-Cola 600 this week had, you know, 50,000 fans and it just, it, yeah. it, it feels, it feels right. It's great to be back. I started the Pepsi 500 one year What's down that? in Daytona. I oh, started the, it. I got the ride in the starting car around the yes, line before right. the race. The pace car. All I, right. I was in the pace car and I was in a Bonneville. We were doing about 135. <laughs> They're behind yeah. us going like this. I'm hanging on the bar going around Daytona. It was it that's was a lot awesome. of fun though. Yeah, I've never it was, gotten it was, to do that. So there you go. That's cool. that, that's great. And I think that the pandemic, and I don't know about your industry, and um, I think that it's really given an opportunity to look at technology to for fan engagement yep. and everything else that can happen now. And I think that that'll grow with AR and everything else coming out. I think that I'm sure you guys have used a lot of that through this to really engage your fans and keep them coming, keep them apart. Yep. For sure. And we, you know, we're so appreciative of our fans for being patient. I know it was hard. You know, the interesting thing about our sport that I said, when we did go back without fans, I do think NASCAR had a natural advantage over other sports in terms of feeling more normal for this reason. During our games, you can't hear the fans anyway, because it's really loud. So during the broadcast, there wasn't that obvious lack of fans as there were in some of the other sports where you're like, yeah. why is it? Either why yeah. is it quiet or that sounds like <laughs> fake piped in noise. The only time it seemed weird was at the end when the guy did his burnout and we get out of the car. Normally you hear boos or cheers and you oh, yeah. hear nothing. And that was kind of weird. But the race <laughs> yeah. itself, if you clipped on the TV, you'd kind of go, oh, yeah, looks like a race. So looks, it, that, looks that like a race. Cool. Yeah, it looks yeah like that is kind of cool. Like a race, you know. Yeah. So, Dave, <laughs> I appreciate you coming on. Please tell all of our fans how they can find your book and how they can yeah. follow you um, uh, and Joe Gibbs racing on social media and everywhere yeah, else. Well, so the book, if you check out taking the lead uh, we've got a little site. You can read all the endorsements we have from drivers and some other folks. Coach Gibbs was gracious enough to write my forward and that's on there. And you can click on whatever your favorite retailer is to buy it, you know, Amazon or what have you. 
Um, yeah, and you can check us out. It, all of our handles are at Joe Gibbs Racing. So Twitter, we've got some phenomenal social media folks that give you a lot of inside scoop. Um, if you want to follow me, I'm on uh, Twitter at, at Pernsky, P-E-R-N-S-K-I. But uh, um, I'm not a huge, uh, I, I am, I'm on social media more as a, a consumer than a producer. Um, but uh, I'd love it if you'd go to takingtheleadbook.com. And I will add one last anecdote. My author proceeds from the book um, are all being donated to the J.D. Gibbs Legacy Fund. So it enables me to more shamelessly promote the book because um, all anything that I would have made is going to get donated to honor my buddy. So uh, it, I, I don't have as much shame in in touting the takingtheleadbook.com. Yeah. So yeah, everybody go to taking the the lead uh, <laughs> book dot com and and obviously everything going to the J D Gibbs was it J D Gibbs J D Gibbs Legacy Fund which we, Legacy we Fund. So yeah, uh, definitely we'll put that on our social media and uh, we appreciate you coming on today. Um, and I want to tell you that this this was an amazing thing. Uh, I've I've been wanting to hear more about NASCAR and racing. We yeah. we interviewed Mario Andretti not too long, you know, a oh, year or so awesome. ago, which was a lot of fun in hearing that story and hearing your story from Northern Virginia. And you know, it feels like we know each other a little bit just because we both we're both Redskins fans and Redskins. Yeah. Uh, you're you're part of the Joe Gibbs family, and there's no more nobody more Redskin than Joe Joe Gibbs. So thanks, Dave, for joining me on Huddle Up with Gus. I appreciate it. Gus, it was my pleasure. I really appreciate it. Th thanks again. Hey, everyone. We want to thank uh, Dave Alpern for joining us today on Huddle Up with Gus. I want to thank 1631 Digital News, my whole team, Terry and Ian, uh, and Super du Producer Brian to, uh, you know, helping me through all this. And then we want to thank Sounder FM for hosting us. Uh, Dave, thank you so much for joining us on Huddle Up with Gus. Everyone, go check out his book at takingtheleadbook.com and just know that all the proceeds from the book uh, for him goes to the J.D. Gibbs uh, Legacy Fund, uh, who was a very good friend. And if you listen to the podcast, obviously you'll know that was his friend. He They were friends for a long time. He's been a part of the Gibbs family um, since the early 80s. And Dave, man, what a story. Appreciate you coming on and sharing it. And check it out at takingtheleadbook.com. And uh, we'll see you next week on Huddle Up with Gus. And that's a wrap, sports fans. Thanks for joining in the fun at the 1631 Digital Studios for another action pack. Huddle Up with Gus, featuring 15 year NFL quarterback Gus Verrat. Huddle Up with Gus is proudly produced by 1631 Digital Media and is available on Apple Music.